Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 574. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. It's Friday the 14th of February, a very special date in the Christian calendar, the Feast of St. Cyril and St. Methodius. And just in case you haven't sent your wife a dozen red roses, St. Valentine as well. Get scribbling on the poems. All right, welcome to another show. This is going to be an action-packed news show. We get lots of stuff going out. The uh, Church of England just finished their General Synod. Uh, there's Pope Francis news. Oh boy, there's Pope Benedict news. There's Franklin Graham news. There's lots of news that we get to cover before we get to the news. You, as a faithful viewer, and you all faithful viewers, we grew thirty percent last year. You're all out there. Have a responsibility to help us. And you do that by clicking the like button on Facebook or YouTube, and that lets those algorithms that run the internet know that we're important. No, seriously, we're important. And I need you to share the show, please. Part of the, our growing is networking, and you can do that by copying this little URL on YouTube or Facebook and sharing it. Let friends know that you are a valuable viewer of Anglican Unscripted. If you've not subscribed yet, please subscribe. Uh, our subscriptions are way up since I mentioned it. I appreciate that. And the comments. You guys are the best commenters ever. We're going to talk about at least two or three of the comments today uh, that we want to highlight. And uh, it's really fun to, to click upload and watch what you guys do in the comments, discussing what we talked about and bringing new aspects to what we talk about. We really appreciate that. Gentlemen, how are you guys doing? It's Valentine's Day. Uh, I'm assuming everybody here has at least got a card for their spouse. Gavin, you're up, you're up first. Uh, uh, what are your plans today? Uh, <clears throat> well, I often take yeah, my you're... wife out for, for a curry, but she said that, it, that it, it, it causes my bowels too much disturbance at night. We won't go any further with that. <laughs> so we settled instead for my buying a joint of beef, which she's going to roast for me. And apparently that will make me less antisocial through the nocturnal hours which is it has to be uh has to be remembered but the, the other thing is i i strongly believe in sending my daughter a valentine's message because um uh i i don't see why why um uh romantic love should be restricted in in to to, to just uh the sort of horizontal uh, erotic stuff and my daughter's always very pleased to know that there's a man out there who loves her even if it's only her dad i thought i might just say that that um, people have asked about people uh, reading lists and authors, um, and at some point, if you ask us about that, I'll, I'll tell you about Charles Williams. One of the things Charles Williams did was to try and tame romantic love, because of course it's so dangerous. It's effectively a, a form of madness that it then becomes hard to contain within the parameters of spiritual discipline. And Williams said that one of the ways of containing it is to see it as, as a gift. For a moment, you see the person you've fallen in love with through the eyes of God, as, as, as utterly lovable and, and wonderful. It's therefore handled in the right way, a spiritual vision. Uh, but like all spiritual visions, it needs to be planted within the context of the gospel, and then it works. Otherwise, it becomes horrendously dangerous, as I think we all know. Uh, candy, flowers, cards, what are you doing, George? Uh, Kevin, the noise you hear in the background, Kevin thought somebody was belching before the start of the show. <laughs> he did. <laughs> um, today is our rummage sale. Ah. And so the only way I can get uh, 300 little old ladies in church at 7 a.m. on this Friday uh, is not by holding an early mass, but by holding a rummage sale. So the, the sound that you hear in the background are people fighting over tat and uh, old lady jewelry and uh, Victorian lamps and moose heads with one antler missing. Uh, it's, it's wonderful day. But, you know, I, I wanted to run off something Ga uh, Gavin said. A friend, mutual friend of Kevin and mine's named Peter Frank uh, is a Facebook friend as well as a personal friend. And he had a comment about a Super Bowl ad. I didn't watch the Super Bowl, but evidently New York Life, uh, the insurance company, ran an, ran an ad talking about uh, Eros and Phileos and a 
and all the different types of love, and in closing with a long exhortation on agape. And it, of course, wasn't because it was an insurance company, it wasn't a religious ad, but it just uh, was, I think, the first time I've ever seen in the public domain uh, the uh, four loves uh, given such an explanation. And it really was very powerful. Hooray for New York life. And thank you, Peter Frank, for pointing that out to me on Facebook. Yeah, it was interesting. Before the Super Bowl, they had a whole uh, homage to the flag, the uh, American flag, uh, probably trying to make up for all the uh, kneeling they had the last two or three years by uh, their players. And uh, then some of the uh, commercials were very decent this year. Uh, a lot of people watch these commercials before they even come out. They're on YouTube. I refuse. If I'm going to sit down and watch the Super Bowl, the only good thing may be the commercials if the game goes bad. And so I want to watch them fresh for the first time. And normally during the commercial, that's when you run to the fridge and get your snacks. I will sit there faithfully and watch some of the stupidest and best produced commercials uh, that uh, Hollywood can offer or agencies. It, it, here's a funny thing, Kevin. Maybe the, my generation, maybe I'm old, but when I was a boy, I followed fanatically the Eagles and the Phillies and the 76ers and the Philadelphia Flyers. And over the years, one by one by one, these sports dropped off. Uh, and this, so it's been two or three years since I watched professional football on TV. And I think it's, be, and it's not because I've lost interest in sports, but I've just lost interest in the people doing the sports. The only thing I'll watch anymore is baseball. Because as you mentioned, foot, basketball you know, has always, has been the craziest, the soonest. And we've had this recent LeBron James controversy about it's better for me to make millions uh, out of Chinese concentration camp sneakers than it is to acknowledge evil. But then we had the Colin Kaepernick football stuff. And I don't know, maybe baseball hasn't gotten got to that point yet. But, you know, popular culture really is corrosive. And we're seeing it in, of all places, sports. What's and it's driving people like me away from watching it. What's interesting, and we see this from Australian football to American uh, uh, football to uh, other sports around the world, the fans hate it when their teams or their leagues uh, or their uh, sport becomes political. Mm -hmm. um, and when <clears throat> the NFL first became political, I think uh, three and a half years ago when people started to kneel, uh, they they left in droves. They said, we're not going to watch it. It's not worth the time. We will give you the benefit of the doubt until you get political. And once you get political, it's all over for us. Papa John's was a major sponsor of the NFL. And two weeks after this kneeling started, uh, their sales plummeted because, uh, you know, they were victims of this uh, pol politicization of the NFL. And, oh, you know, does this extend to the church as well? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let's talk quickly, move on to uh, the Church of England. They just finished uh, their... Before we oh. begin, I think we need uh, our teacher to give us a summary then of Ashenden's Law. Uh, Gavin? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've, we've shared this in the past, but Ashenden's Law on Spirituality, which is uh, Dr. Ashenden. Well, you're, you're, you're very kind, George. And every year that goes by, it seems to me to prove it correct. And it simply is that there is an inverse relationship of proportion um, between the amount of uh, engagement that a church and the Christians uh, um, involve themselves with politically to their spiritual life. If you have a rich spiritual life, uh, you know that you are busy fighting the demons, fighting evil, uh, bringing souls through to the light, um, breaking the shackles of, of, of unforgiveness. And frankly, you, this is so powerful and lasts such a long time, there is, a, there is no need whatsoever to engage yourself very much in the ephemeral currents of political debate. I guess there are times when there, are, when there ought to be um, some standout exceptions. I think one obvious exception is, is to, to slavery and abortion, I think. Wherever you see slavery and abortion, all Christians ought to drop everything and go and help. But I think with those two exceptions, Ashenden's law is the inverse proportion relationship between life in the spirit and, and life in politics. And what can we I'm have not? an example of this from this past week from the Synod of the Church of England? <laughs> oh, George, this is like playing, playing easy tennis. What a, what a wonderful <laughs> lob. Thank you very much. 
Well, I approach the net in order to smash this right down into the corner and say that I think one of the most unpleasant experiences I've ever had in Christian terms happened this week as I watched Justin Welby apologise for not having been woke enough soon enough. And I, I really... I'm sorry, I thought it was a parody. I, th I thought this must be a parody. But um, he tore up a speech. There had been a speech about uh, from somebody who, who I'm sure very movingly had said that they and their family as um, immigrants into England had not been welcomed enough in English churches. I'm sure that's true and, and, and that's dreadful. Um, ugly people also aren't welcome enough in churches and um, people with bad breath and people who sing out of tune. There's a whole load of people who get a rough time when they turn up in churches but i'm sure it was also and, true and christians people. when they turn up in church of england parishes <laughs> yes, <laughs> they get a really rough time of it too but i interrupt go ahead get <laughs> you, you do but beautifully and to such great effect um and so he made made the point that um, england was in, inflexibly racist i think he was talking about 30 years ago or more and this 50, made the archbishop 50 50 it, it was no it was 50 you're right now i recollect it was my childhood um, and, and Welby was over, so overwhelmed by this, he tore up his speech and then began to beat his breast and lament. Uh, and he lamented his white privilege. Um, uh, now the, 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 the reason this is, is silly is not because we're just mocking him because he presents an easy target, but it's terribly serious. The, the whole notion of privilege in Christian terms is it, it comes as responsibility. If the Lord has given us anything, from, from, from good looks to a good voice to a good brain to, to two legs at work, from those to whom much is given, much is required. That's the text by which we interpret whatever privileges we have. Um, and, and if we are deeply privileged, and some of us are, then that, that we're called to, to, to real responsibility. But Welby has lost this completely, and he began to lament. And what this means is he's completely swallowed the Marxist trope because the way in which he did it was the current Marxist narrative that all relationships of any importance are interpreted by their power relations. And so he stood up there and, and lamented uh, in Marxist terms uh, the unfair power relations he had benefited from. I, I, I mean, I, I could, I really found it hopelessly tragic. I mean, incredibly, incredibly sad. And no, not a word was raised anywhere that, that he'd made a very serious category error and was using the Church of England Synod as a platform for one of the most serious and dangerous heresies that the, that the faith has faced for 500 years. But let's be clear. Racism, real. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it's real, you know, thousands of years ago, it's real today. However, apologizing for being white is cowardly. Okay, let, can I, I'm going to really worry people now, and you can cut me off and cut this out. Cut, cut, no, no, so go, go, go. Three, I, cut, I said something look. controversial, you can too. <laughs> Well, I wrote an article two weeks ago for the Jersey Evening Post, effectively saying, calling, the, calling into question whether there is such a thing as racism. Now, this is not because I'm a white supremacist or because I don't think it's absolutely dreadful when some people hate each other for, for, for their skin color or anything else. But the, I, I have to say, I don't understand racism. Um, we, within our family, uh, we have a different series of skin tones. Where, whereabouts in terms of skin tone do you draw the line and say you move from being kind of Mediterranean olive tanned to something unacceptable? Science knows nothing of, 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 of races per se. Um, but I think what, we're, what, what I think we should do occasionally is try and find the Christian explanation for this. Uh, we don't find racism in the Bible. What we find is, is human antipathy, people hating each other. And, and using a whole variety of excuses to demonize and hate one another. And this can be your, your, your nation, your race, your accent, your size, um, physical characteristics, personality characteristics. That the trouble with, with, with restricting it to racism or even using racism as a category when it may not be one is that you then cover up the, 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 the dreadful spiritual corrosion of broken human relationships. And, and if you do that, then you don't ask the right question. And the, the answer to the right question is always Jesus. <laughs> it, Jesus comes to mend our broken, corrosive relationships, whether they express themselves in terms of being uncomfortable with how somebody looks or thinks or speaks. And therefore, I, I, I do think that Christians should be a bit careful about automatically trying to find social forgiveness 
by adopting social categories of, of analysis. Now, I have to warn everyone, be careful. And if, if I persuaded you, be very careful how you express this, because, now, because it has become so intense that people will jump on you thinking that you're promoting racism by by trying by saying it doesn't exist. But there, there's the point. In 2020, everything is racism. Every uh, differing point of view, that's racism. Uh, every time the temperature's too high or too low, that's climate change. Every time, you know, everything we identify, we, we put a label on. And the and, label of racism applies to every time you disagree with somebody. And the reason this matters is because the Church of England has, has dedicated itself to apologizing for being racist. Well, first of all, an apology is not going to make anyone less racist. It, it has no effect. But secondly, if it understood what, what caused racism, original sin, uh, and the fact that we are badly demonized and, and, and hate with, with the devil's hate, it might then be much more inclined to support Franklin Graham's mission, which is one of the best ways of getting people out of racism you could imagine by inviting them to know Jesus, to be loved by Jesus, to forgive their enemies, and to begin this slow period of transformation by, when, by which we look differently at people in the world. If it was really serious about what it calls racism, it would be supporting any evangelistic initiative that worked. Okay, we're, George, we're, I need you to help us out. Not everybody knows with which uh, Gavin is speaking with the Franklin Graham, Graham issue. We have a new audience, so help us out. Okay. Uh, Franklin Graham, the American evangelist, uh, has sketched a tour of the UK, and a number of venues uh, have canceled because of pressure from gay and lesbian groups, because Franklin Graham is unapologetic in his promotion of biblical morality. And this is considered hate speech, and a number of, I think, Glasgow or Dundee, or I mean, just a variety of venues around the uh, our auditoriums or even private uh, venues, activists have uh, urged their cancellation. And among the activists encouraging the cancellation is the Bishop of Sheffield, I think, uh, saying, we don't want this outside agitator coming down to Mississippi and stirring up the natives. Uh, we want to uh, keep everybody happy. Um, and it is nothing to do with Franklin Graham's. Uh, it's This is uh, the cancel culture now being taken on board by the Church of England in order to appease the looniest of the loony left. Um, the I was just going to comment about Justin Welby is that the man is so pedestrian. I don't think he's an evil man. Uh, I don't know what's in his heart or in his mind, but I can look at what he says and does. And he is just always late to the party. If <laughs> one of the things that I think the last the election of Boris Johnson showed was that and the autopsies being performed on the Labour Party. The Labour Party uh, essentially is not a viable ongoing institution among the working class. They've done, I think it was, uh, oh, I forget which, uh, but there was an autopsy done by a Labour peer who went into and talking to former Labour voters, people who lived in the North, who had for three or four generations had voted Labour, and what do you think of the Labour Party? The Labour Party is the party of students, of left-wing intellectuals, and the urban elites. It has nothing to do with us. They use us as their cause, but then they do follow their own issues. And one of the reasons why uh, British politics was upended in the last election was the it's the same reason why Donald Trump was elected. He, there was some poll yesterday, Quinnipiac poll, that shows Bernie Sanders beating Donald Trump by 15, uh, 15%. Now, if anybody believes that, I've got a bridge to sell them uh, in Brooklyn. <laughs> my, my, point, my point is, is that um, the conventional uh, smart wisdom is so often so wrong. And Justin Welby has had a terrible knack of taking the conventional social and political wisdom and applying it to church solutions, not realizing that the moments have passed. The, this racism, I mean, we roll our eyes. This is not, we roll our eyes when we hear about racism these days because it's so silly. We're not living in a culture where Hutus and Tutsis are killing each other. Uh, you know, we, we all can point to real examples of violent, evil, extremist racism. 
We had an American Episcopal bishop get up the other day at the installation of the Bishop of uh, Michigan, say the major problems facing the Episcopal Church are white supremacy. Kevin, I live in the deep rural South. I have worked amongst the rural poor for 20, the last 20 years in Florida, from, from Okeechobee to Avon Park. These are not the exclusive uh, island resorts. These are the working poor, the people who pick up your trash and pave your driveways and all this and that and pick the grapefruits. I have never met a white supremacist. I've never met one. Well, what and, you say is, in other words, where, where are, where is, are these book? I mean, I don't want to get into the Jesse Smollett case, but where are these raving white supremacists that we need to be protected from? Where is this racism? I mean, how can you talk about racism in the Church of England when Rose Hudson Wilkes, Hudson Taylor, uh, is promoted a bishop without anything to do with merit, but because she's the right sex and the right color? Forget being competent, let's just have another, uh, let's just have a different hue in the group picture. How can racism know. be an issue when we've reached that point of tokenism, so desperately uh, awful? I don't know if it was Pew or what research company did this, and it, it's probably six or seven years old, but they did a, a study of the most racist states in the United States of America. And anybody who knows anything would think, well, Alabama, probably number one, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Mississippi, uh, Mississippi, you know, all the, the places where there were lynchings in, in the 40s, 50s and 60s. No, I think Connecticut, where I live, was number two or three. Uh, other northeastern states were number one and two. Uh, it was just amazing to see the northeast coast, the progressive liberal uh, uh, part of this country was the most racist because a lot of them are just doing it to say it. They aren't really, they, they don't, you know, walk the walk or talk the talk. Uh, these are very racist uh, people out here who just use black as a political forum, who just use racism as a political forum. And I'd like to, sorry, Kevin. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I'd, well I'd, 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 I'd like to extend George's criticism. Um, first of all, I watched Rose Hudson Wilkin. Uh, and and George is absolutely right. The irony of the fact that here is a, uh, a an, an, an intellectually un underpowered lady being promoted to one of the senior bishoprics in the Church of England, and then every single opportunity when she gets a microphone berating the Church of England for not being kind enough to uh, to ethnic minorities is the irony is lost on her completely. I'd like to extend it though to something I thought was quite important. It's part of the same conversation. Um, there was an, argu an article, an, an argument in Synod about Anglican vicarages. And the, a vicar stood up and said, I live in a very big vicarage and it's a terrible impediment to evangelism. And the sooner we get rid of these uh, vicarages, the better. Um, I, I, when I was in the Diocese of Southwark for, for 10 years and during that time, I was the only vicar that lived in government housing. Uh, I, I lived on a council estate in a council house that we rented from the council. Um, at no point ever in my ministry did I notice that people were resist more or less resistant to Jesus because of my 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 house, um, and we're back again to saying what what's the gospel criterion? Once again, um, the whatever the more you've been given, the more is expected of you. One of the great tragedies of the Church of England is is that it did have these marvelous big vicarages which you can either see if you look through class eyes as signs of social snobbery, or you can see as the most wonderful resource that can be used for a whole variety of reasons. If you have a big and well-built house that you can use uh, as, an, as a Christian center, then there can be times in the winter if you only have 10 people for even song, when it would be better to have the liturgy in your front room. Uh, when, but, but all the church women could say was, this, we see our large vicarages as a class issue and we must get rid of them in order to foster evangelism. There is no evidence anywhere that I've ever heard of. One has to be careful saying this, but, but, but uh, there isn't any. So please show me if there is. That the size of the vicar's vi vicarage gets in the way of him explaining Jesus. Other things might be. If he was a pompous snob, I might well believe that in combination with living in a big house, that wouldn't go down very well. But that's not the point. The point is... If you adopt socialism or left-wing criteria, 
you entirely miss the spiritual diagnosis that is offer, that is open to us. And, and the spiritual di diagnosis here is, if you've got something worthwhile, work out how you use it for Jesus and the kingdom. Don't sell it because you're trying to buy credit for a political program. Gavin, see, this is, I, the man who raised this uh, motion, uh, issue, I would call a fatuous idiot. Um, because here's how an, an intelligent organization addresses these things. Let's run a small scale study. Yeah. Let's take a section, let's take a deanery in Southwark where there are no nice vicarages because we sold them all off uh, a generation ago and the vicars all have to live in council houses or provide their own accommodation with an allowance. Let's, me let's make, make that our test case and then see how rates of evangelization work in that area compared to the wider church. Now, what you'll find in Southwark is that they probably, they do, they do a much worse job than they do across the river in London. So here we've got some fatuous idiot who doesn't understand organizations, who ha needs an explanation for his personal failure as a minister. Why is everybody staying away from his church? It uh, can't be me because I'm not preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. It must be because I have a vic Victorian monstrosity that is scaring the children. This is, this is spiritual blindness, intellectual stupidity, a lot, you know, one of the Justin Welby was brought in to be Archbishop of Canterbury because he was su a successful middle manager. He was an oil company executive, and the man has n has no. The Church of England has no business smarts understanding. They don't I, know I, how to test, you know, test these things. George, I need to correct you here. Um, I don't know if you understand the carbon footprint of these larger. Um, buildings and rectories and vestiges that we're talking about. But if you have a small, broken down home that you can have solar and wind power versus a huge mansion uh, built, you know, eons ago that has no insulation and just uh, it, it's run by coal furnaces, there's a difference, George. And we, we, I speak of this because the Church of England is going to be carbon neutral by 20. 30, which is awesome because I think their doors are going to close in 2025. So they will be carbon neutral five years after they, they close the doors. Gavin and I are going on diets in 2075. That's, <laughs> that is our target day. Good target 2075, day. we will have lost all this excess poundage around our middles. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm that is what we'll strongly work for. I'm going to shift a conversation which makes me feel profoundly uncomfortable, and you're quite right, George. I think we should give credit where it's due. There's a very sensible lady called Prudence Daly. Prudence is, is, is president of the Prayer Book Society. And Prudence braved the idiots by standing up and saying that whatever the Church of England did, it would be trying like to, like to emptying an ocean with a pipette. Uh, and, you know, she's, she's exactly right, of course. But, but this was completely lost on the virtue signaling audience because... Christianity has given way to looking at the world through secular cultural paradigms. And, and this is not a left-right thing. It, 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 one of the reasons we're, we're mocking the left, I think simply, is because the left has, has such success in indoctrinating people so that their worldview, instead of becoming Christian, spiritual, redemptive, has become political, uh, social. Uh, and, and the problem is it doesn't have any power. You can't save souls and turn lives around with, with, a, with a leftist secular ideology. But you can by preaching the gospel and seeing the world through the, eye, through, through the eyes of, of, of biblical clarity. Well, they've replaced... Kevin, Kevin, Kevin I, I, must, I must ask you a question. Do, 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 uh, do. You are, you are uh, uh, an intelligent uh, businessman who's au courant with the National News. Uh, who, is the worst human, uh, who is the worst <laughs> human being in the world according to the left... That would be Donald Trump, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I mean, and, it, and Donald Trump, Bernie Madoff, you know. D but. Donald Trump is anti-science, and he wants us all to uh, basically burn bonfires and cut down all the forests and, and everything. And under Trump, tell us how the United States has done in reducing its carbon emissions. What has this unfettered capitalism of the United States done compared to, say, the socially conscious uh, English, England, or uh, Europe? 
Okay, before we get started, I'm not a fan of Donald Trump, but I look into the reality of what he's done. The reality is, since dropping out of the French Accords, which was this big uh, conglomerate of all the world's uh, countries coming together to end uh, climate change in America, not the world, uh, he dropped out and said, it's not realistic. You're asking us to reduce our emissions by 25%, and you're asking Asia to reduce theirs by half a percent. That's, that's not real. That's stupid. Unbeknownst to anybody else, uh, there was a study done. Uh, it's been done every year, but it's called the IDU. I forget what, the, what it stands for. And America, since 2000, has reduced their carbon emissions the most in a study done in 2019. Uh, more than any other country. Any other virtual sig uh, signaling country does not compete on the market share of reducing their carbons as America has done. Uh, amazing. You know, and we've done that through many different uh, ways, uh, reduction in coal plants and, and stuff like that. I own a Nissan Leaf, an electric car. Uh, but I think the, rea the reality is until we take on Asia and China, which have raised their carbon emissions by 80% over the last 10 years, th this is a fool's game. See, what's happened in the United States is technology and the free market have responded to perceived demands and peop and and accordingly the infrastructure of the United States is gradually shifting. Now, Kevin, I'm a car nut, so I, I have to get this in. A leaf actually pollutes more than my uh, Mercedes Benz uh, six cylinder well, engine. It, it, it's true. You know why? Yeah. Because to generate the electricity, they have to use the coal plant, and the coal plant uses more, releases more carbon into the air to generate the same amount of power to move your leaf as does the internal combustion engine in my car. So actually, electric cars are more polluting than uh, gasoline yeah. and diesel fuel cars. But hey, I have to that facts, George, that, that, those are facts. They don't matter. No, no, I, I, I agree with you. In order, in order to save George from from being um, attacked unnecessarily uh, in the comments, um, we're having so this only debate. necessarily attack. You may attack me out of necessity, <laughs> but unnecessarily, Gavin will draw the line for you. Absolutely, I shall encourage all necessary attacking and undermining of George <laughs> when when, it, when and if it ever arises. Um, so we're having this debate too in in England at the moment, and um, and apparently the answer is as you, George, you're quite right in saying that everything depends upon how the electricity is made. So those in favour of the Nissan Leaf, and there are many of them, say that that, that as, as the electricity is moved towards greener supplying, so the Leaf becomes uh, more effective. Oh, oh my goodness, I have completely... Th well, this, isn't it, it, this is wonderfully prophetic. My, com my, my computer tells me I've failed to plug it into the mains and it's about to crash. <laughs> your, your windmill has died, has it? It's a calm day. Absolutely. Well, you better go take care of it quick. We'll talk. So you, you, you two talk, and I'm going to try and find the plug. <laughs> I'll be well, back. The, so the, the, the thing, gov government intervention, whether it, uh, or statist intervention, whether it be the Church of England, whether it be the state it's issuing regulations, is not the answer. They can work in partnership with free market, with technology, with science, and they can help create an environment that uh, people would like this. But to, for the Church of England to say, uh, the they, they, original motion was 2045 will be carbon neutral, and they moved it to 2030. Why didn't they move it to 2025? Or why not tomorrow? I mean, I they're just not going to meet it. A, a, spiritual, a spiritual word, which is that, that however correct you are in your views, if you're stupid and irresponsible, it isn't going to help. And on that note, I'm going to try Go and run, run. stupidity and irresponsibility. Back now, to so the audience knows why I bought a Nissan Leaf. I bought them off lease, and the local dealership couldn't move them. I got a 2014 Nissan Leaf for $10,000. Pocket change. Of course I'm going to buy a Nissan Leaf when everything else uh, in the – in the market that I was shopping for was twenty five, thirty thousand dollars. So uh, it's a great bargain car. I call it the golf cart. Until it breaks. When it breaks, and it will break one day, <laughs> you've only you can only take it to the dealership. Uh well. Oh yeah. yeah there I mean, may be because the, there is no uh aftermarket of uh, local mechanics at your corner who can work with see when you work on see when I 
you know, when I work on my car and I've got the 12 volt battery, if I wanted to, I could stick my tongue in the terminals and I would not get electrocuted. You can't kill yourself working on a regular car. Distributor the, cap. The 300 volts going through the, uh, the in hybrid cars, and I don't know what it is on the electric cars, mm. and you have to wear electrician's gloves, which are the gloves that are t where to put them on, you have to take the inside, the rubber part out, <clears throat> blow it up, see if there are any holes. Then you put that on. Then you put the electrical gloves on. And because if there's a hole, you'll kill yourself. Do you think uh, Jethro at the corner shell station is going to be able to work on your car when it breaks? No, and I, I absolutely agree with you. Uh, however, for $10,000, I was not turning that away. And uh, it, it's paid for itself many times over because the the real value was taken out by the first owner or the real money asset part. So let's move on. We'll stop talking about climate change. We'll stop talking about racism. We're going to talk about comments. So we're in favor of racism, just to make sure so our, our critics can necessarily... <laughs> we're in favor of racism, <laughs> and we want, a, we want oil refineries built in green countrysides everywhere. Exactly. Yeah, that's what people would uh, take us out of context and saying. And we can't even joke about stuff like that because they can trim what you just said there. Thankfully, I was making a funny face at the time uh, and put this that up and say, this is what you, yeah, yeah. <laughs> ah, you know, oh, it's, it's, it's a new world. So let's move on to the comments. Um, I hope you guys picked one. I'm just going to go right off the top here. Um, ooh, here's a compliment for Kevin. I must say that I'm glad that Kevin has turned a corner on his production value. Lighting on Kevin is top notch. George and Gavin remain in their original warm but amateur look. <laughs> <laughs> Talking heads rock. No, uh, no, no. See what you see around <laughs> Gavin. See, Gavin has the the halo effect. That's not due to light refraction. No, it's not. He's yeah, got but a four it's actually a charism of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> you see around Kevin, just as you see around saints and Orthodox and Catholic churches, a halo around him of golden white light, displaying the power of the Spirit in his life. It's a very careful Photoshop app, which I, which I invested <laughs> heavily. <laughs> well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a quick picture of this corner of the studio. So when I'm talking about it, I'll put this up. Uh, yes. Uh, Investments have been made in this part of the studio because we feed in Gavin's feed into here and George's feed into here. Then I shoot their feeds out so they can see each other on camera as well. Right now, George is seeing the three of us and Gavin is seeing the three of us. And it makes for more... The three? Uh, yes, three. And it makes okay. for better yeah, the eye three contact. of us, I see. I'm sorry. I thought there were the it, six of us here. It, talking just into a camera without seeing the reaction of the other three doesn't work that well. We tried that a long time ago. You basically need to have, in, in this type of format, to have the camaraderie and the action and the show we produce. We have to see what the other people are expressing when we talk. When I'm talking and I see George yawning or reaching for his cup or looking at his watch, I know maybe I need to wrap it up a little. I know if Gavin drops something, he will pick it up on camera. He will just go off the side and, oh, I got it, I got it. It's not that his camera turned off. It's he drops something. He doesn't plug things in all the time either. George yeah. always has a cup, a huge <clears throat> gulp cup, just out of sight. Where You got that with you? There it is. <laughs> and I have my marketing cup for Anglican TV. So... Yes, uh, production value. I hope to, in the future, be able to get a better camera for Gavin and a better uh, camera for George. The most important part of having the better setup is to always have a permanent setup. These guys kind of have been operating mobile from Gavin's chapel to Gavin's library. Uh, George is in his kitchen sometimes, and here it's, it's hard to have a permanent camera. I'm always seated at Anglican TV studios or in a hotel room. That's why we have this. So, any comments you guys see? Well, I, I just want to say I'm really enjoying the comments. Um, I, I think that th th there are lots, and I'd completely forgotten that I, I thought you were going to provide them. My, my, oh, state, no. That's my right. statist view towards the editorial process meant that I would infantilize myself and uh, hope that you would. But, but since you put me on the spot, I just want to say um, I'm, I'm very grateful for, for the comments. I think people um say some very helpful things and one of the things that it, it does for me at any rate is to 
um, help me get over the uh, the kind of slightly juvenile blindness to our audience. It's 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 very good to know you're out there and to know that we're talking to uh, intelligent, kind individuals of an independent cast of mind who who either ask us serious questions um, or, or hold us to account for things. It's it's some very useful conversations take place. Um, Kev Kevin. I think, I think I think the only thing I'd like to say is is that is that it's just a quick caveat that we are talking unscripted and and if we occasionally we we truncate things so they have little sophistication and little depth and that's not necessarily a sign of our own stupidity it might be contextual it might be because talking unscripted and even writing in the comments we can't deal properly with some of the huge issues we touch on well, I, want George, to, I want to touch on two comments well One, I want to I, I want to address a comment that was to you George yeah. Okay. It's from you are name here. <laughs> I don't always agree with Father George. And this is to our unscriptedness. You yeah, did is this, this last my week. wife now that's right. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, that would say I always don't agree with George. I don't always agree with you, Father George, but his gearhead analogy works really well. Kudos, Father. And that's part of unscripted. We don't sit here with at all all a script. Our best shows are done with the least pre-show. Um, I, I do want to touch on two, two, one specific and one general thing. Uh, Gavin gets uh, a great deal of abuse from certain quarters for being a bog-trotting papist that has let down the side. <laughs> and uh, he's uh, basically, you know, uh, just done a... Uh, he, he's race, just... Race. A disservice to the Not queen. Listening. Yes, he, he, he's, a, he's a race defiler. He's like Franklin Roosevelt, a traitor to his class. Um, so why do we allow this class traitor, uh, this uh, agent for Italian influence on the British Isles, onto our show? I'd be well, wondering that too. <laughs> yeah, that was like, tell me why. <laughs> Just as the three stooges needed their shemp. So... <laughs> oh, 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 oh. No, no, no. Uh but uh, oh, no, um, because Gavin has always been Gavin. Uh, it, just as uh, his mind, his thought, his experience, his life is just as it always been. He's on a path. He's on a trajectory. I don't agree with some of the conclusions he's drawn from this path, but I certainly wouldn't argue that he has a vital, important issues to share and perspectives to give. Um, I've, you know. We 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 uh, moderate some of the nastier things, and then there's some people who say, "Well, as long as there's a Catholic on the show, you shouldn't call this Anglican unscripted." Well, I'm enough an Episcopalian to suffer cover all sins of all of our <laughs> cohorts. <laughs> no, but I I I I do think that uh, I don't want to say stop pushing this line because people are free to comment, but uh, I really do like the ability to have uh, at times diametrically opposing viewpoints. But with the same end goal, the same uh, same perspective of that uh, it's Jesus Christ and Him crucified that we preach. I probably had about a dozen correspondences with viewers from England, uh, from the British Isles, who said, "You got to dump them." I said, "Okay, I'll dump them. You give me one person of uh, Gavin's caliber." that understands Marxism, cultural Marxism, understands church history, understands, uh, you know, kind of the pragmatism of, of church history uh, the way he does, and I'll replace him. Crickets. Yeah, I mean, Gavin's Gavin, and, you know, <clears throat> yeah, he went to Rome, but uh, he still speaks very well because he is an expert on Anglicanism, much like I'm an expert on Microsoft, and I use Apple. Yeah, I'm just done, you know. I I'm, I'm going to take some some kind of revenge on on you guys, and so I want to say that not everyone is as broad-minded and as hospitable as I am. I'm very willing to sit with you two. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and, and I I don't allow your obvious your your obvious uh, inc incompetences and 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 uh, lacunae to affect my social stand. I I simply carry it off with a degree of dignity. Um, that comes naturally to me. But I have to say, there are important people in England who should be invited on here, but you're going to have a hard time getting some of them to do it because <laughs> it would require them to tell the truth. Um, and one of the advantages that I have at the moment, which God has given me, and I'm, I'm jolly well going to use it, I'm not beholden to anybody, and I'm therefore able to tell the truth. And there are some splendid Anglican voices 
which I hope you'll get on. I mean, Kevin, people may not know, but you invite them. I mean, I we sit I down. We sit down and, and we produce a list of people and say, let's get this person on next time because they've got something to say. Kevin invites them and, and they, they, say, they say no for a number well, of reasons. They say no or they say yes, I'll get back to you. The yes, I get back. That's the English term, I guess. Um, now, you can tell I invited Melvin Tinker. He showed up. No, you know, that was an awesome show. I'm not going to name the people publicly who have invited here, um, but there you have to sign off on not being able to be very uh how do i say this uh you can't have to get be away with being diplomatic. you can't you get have away to be unscripted yeah and you can't just be diplomatic on the show you can't take both sides of every answer that's how you say it well nice one stuff. another comment i'd like to address is uh, i spoke last issue uh, last show about uh basically starving the institutions of funds that mm. it, that has a long and storied history at least in the episcopal church in the 1960s uh the uh national church went off the deep end in the late 60s had a special general convention to, to introduce you know how we're going to repent for the sin of racism so gavin justin welby as always is 30 or 40 years behind the curve we've been there we've done that and the net result was dioceses withheld money from the national church. And that all began over the hard left move in the late 60s on race issues. And then, of course, that got back. The next issue was women clergy, then prayer book reform, then the gay issues, and then Catherine Jefferson Shorey being a, the Wicked Witch of the West. So it, it's taken different forms and different colors. But how do you do that? Well, you do it wisely. Uh, in the Diocese of Southwark, there's the Good Stewards Trust, where you can redirect part of your parish share into an organization, an entity that's transparent, that uses it for building the work of the gospel. So in essence, you're not keeping this money to build even more rooms onto your monstrous vicarage that uh, now has a helipad and a pool, but rather doing the work of the gospel. In my particular circumstances, we're having, we have a parish missionary. We have a young woman who for the last seven years has uh, worked in an outreach program in Hamburg, Germany, uh, working with trafficked women. So I will introduce her with the same stale joke. I'd like to introduce you to the one girl who's been to every one of Hamburg's 450 brothels. That girl is not a line item in our budget, yet we support her work. She's a commissioned missionary, the uh, Diocese of Central Florida and from this parish. But we don't run her through the budget, because if we did, then we'd have to pay a 12% tax to the diocese on every dollar we raise. So we have specific fundraisers. So our budget is basically targeted towards plant equipment and clergy operations. And so that slims it down. And then on top of that, we do one-off uh, fundraisers and projects there where the money doesn't pass through the church, so it doesn't get touched, but is used to accomplish the work of Christ in the world. Now, what am I saying? Is, this, is, is the answer hiring clever accountants? No, it's not being stupid. Don't say, okay, here I am, a vicar, where half my support comes from the diocese, and I'm going to go up to the bishop and say, I dare you to, I dare you to do something. Well, he can, he can do whatever he wants. But what you do is gracefully, gradually decouple from, pro from national program, from uh, national initiatives, and use your funds in a way that can that everybody sees what's being done. It's all above the board. Everybody knows what's going on, so that you cannot be held to be greedy, but rather, instead of losing 12% or 18% in some diocese of every penny you raise to a vociferous machine, it's used to do the work of the gospel, which in this case for this girl, who's come home on leave for two weeks. It's taking women from Ukraine and Belarus out of prostitution and into, uh, into, into life that is a lie. Okay, Be guys. Clever, clever how you do this, because otherwise, you know, part of the problem with the start of the ACNA where there's some guys who just wanted to be martyred. They, they just wanted, uh, they were looking for an excuse to be uh, strung up and burned, and they didn't do this well, and it didn't end well. So we're at 51 minutes. That's a long episode of English script. In fact, if you get home tonight and you're talking to your, your uh, 
a loving spouse or your significant other, and they say, hey, what do you want to do tonight? And I say, oh, there's a new Anglican unscripted out. You, you need to find another significant other. You don't need to watch us on Valentine's Day, but you probably will anyway. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. And remember, on the 14th of February, your real Valentine is our Lord Jesus Christ, who will never, ever let you down. You've been listening to episode 574 of Anglican Unscripted, and St. Cyril and Methodius were quite cool too.